Welcome to Dulce the New Guy commentary with uh, Gene Hoyle. Konnichiwa. And Chuck Pino. <laughs> What's going on, now. everybody? <laughs> so um, from here, we're going to go through the book page by page and um, talk about some behind the scenes. And Can, can we first talk about this kick-ass cover? Yeah, you know what? That's the cover is a great place to begin. I love it because first off, it looks like almost any office I've ever visited or worked at. Besides the the chamber in the back, it's exactly <laughs> like any place I've ever worked at. Yeah, like he nailed the workroom break room. Like, it's, I have a question about the cover actually, and I never really paid I never really paid much attention to it. What the hell is stealing a donut down in the bottom right hand corner? <laughs> It's some kind of alien thing. He's got a baseball cap on, though. Yeah, he's a worker. Oh, God. We should have brought him in. All right. <laughs> issue three. Yeah, so three. <laughs> yeah issue three. That's it. <laughs> we'll get the backstory someday. <laughs> One of my favorite things was the the mug. World's best ancient spirit deity. Yes. Because I, I love the idea of ancient aliens and the, like, you know, that our gods and such might have been... So, like, for these characters to potentially have come from a line of characters that were misinterpreted as gods, just is amazing. Plus, it's a little hint towards Francis's uh, species and how they operate. Yeah. Yes. We don't really get into that in this issue, but it's a it's foreshadowing to something that we again foreshadow in the second issue. I think sure. my favorite and thing on the cover is the fact that there's so much amazing technology like when you look through the book and whatnot there's so much amazing awesome technology and yet chamness has a freaking walkman <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even have a, he doesn't even have like a disc man or anything it's 1980s walkman dude <laughs> yeah this cover is amazing and then it is the hand in the back coming after marcus like oh my gosh yes. oh, yeah now, he really did get all of that. I don't even remember what his um, direction was on this. I don't remember what we told him. I'm sure we did not tell him this. <laughs> I, will, I will tell you, mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that's amazing about Greg Warrenchak is that he, he just, when he loves something, he instinctually gets it and makes yeah. things so much better than what was even in your head. Yeah, I agree. And then yeah. Avery... And like yeah. the way he adds shape and form to things with color is just yeah. brilliant. I mean, there's yeah, just so much color. It's so it's just color beautiful. and and texture. There's texture yeah. to all yeah. these characters. Every yeah. one of them. It's bright, but it, it doesn't hurt your eyes. You know what I mean? Like it just sure. it, it's just like this perfect level of colorful and fun, but it it doesn't at any point overdo it. No, and like that war the very warm wall there. Like framing the very cool colors and the like, it just frames Marcus and the hand. I mean, Greg's drawing framed it, but then he uses color to really draw your eye there and yeah. just. And you'll notice that with issue two, although the it, it's similar characters in there, Marcus is on both covers. It's a very different color scheme on the cover. It's darker but still bright, and it, it's really a good contrast for. Yep, I agree. Well, and I think it also, those colors speak more to the actual issue. Uh, this art issue was a little more uh, lighthearted, whereas there's a little more mystery and darkness in the second one. Yeah, that's true. Sure. So, if you're going to judge a book by its cover, there you go. It's a, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> we nailed it. <laughs> this is a good one, yes. One thing to mention, I guess, heading into the first page, where uh, Marcus heads into the elevator to head towards the EIE department that he's going to be working at is that this issue is actually is a prelude for it in the Nerd Nation Presents comic like the leads directly up to this panel and yeah think, it's beautiful yeah I think uh, that's worth mentioning and that was so well done too because when you guys originally brought me on I just helped to edit the, the four pager so I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't know a lot of the the bigger story and stuff. And so when it immediately started afterwards, I was like, oh, damn, I really love what they're doing here. Like, this is kind of badass. 
Well, well, um, Chuck, page by page, we don't know what we're, we're doing either, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's what keeps me busy, right? <laughs> exactly. God, that used to be a disjointed mess. <laughs> Guys, I don't even know who this character is. Like, he's not even... I think he's from a different book. <laughs> Screw it. Let's make him invisible, and we'll we'll throw him in here anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so actually we we initially had bigger plans for this uh flying robot that's with our yes I, he kind of fell by the wayside he was gonna be a much bigger deal um not like a main character but he was gonna I like guess, a butler more like i think he was gonna be a real pain in the ass to marcus like oh cool <laughs> well maybe maybe he still can be we'll see um, yeah, three <laughs> I mean, we only have 37 characters so far, so one more would be, right? Hey, you know what I did notice, though? In panel, I guess it's technically three. Oh, yeah. There's a little slime dude from the, uh, yeah. the cover. The donut stealer. <laughs> nice. <laughs> donut stealer. Isn't it really funny that a year later we can look at this and see things ourselves that we didn't see before? Right. <laughs> Chuck, you're the <laughs> Editor, how did you not see this? Oh, <laughs> I'm so fired. I just double checked to make sure this was the book we wrote. Yeah, we're both in the credits. Okay, so, yeah, we're not. But again, uh, this shows the like how how much we trusted Greg because yeah, I mean he he put this stuff in. He he had that attention to detail and that that love for the the book that he. I mean, we gave him a lot of free reign. We just we wrote a story and he. Build the pages. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, in my opinion, a Gene Ha influence, like from Top Ten, where there's all this crazy stuff going on in the background. It mm -hmm. could almost tell a whole different story. Right. And actually, going into pa pa uh, page two, panel one. Look at the that computer board, that whole wall of computers. I don't know what all that stuff does, but I think Greg does. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's Every a button. lot of stuff there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and like, and more kudos to um, our art team and Avery on colors. If my color this right now would be two shades of gray. Like, that yeah, would be, that would be what you would get. And, and here, here's another nod to Greg and how good he is. Uh, look at that that computer screen and that whole wall area there. Then look at the cover of issue two. It's the same place, very clearly the right. exact same wall. So good, oh, so amazing. Yeah, that is the a guy's really good got point. it. That's yeah. That's massive attention to detail, man. So what else? We're on page two now, right? Right. I'm trying to look here. What else we got? It looks like I they have some killer chairs to sit on. <laughs> I love when Francis gets in Marcus's face. Like it's just like first day on the job. You're meeting this this alien crew, and like this is like this big fly monster that's like right up in your face. And when you know a little bit more about Francis and his species, you kind of get why. Marcus is a little put off by that. And we are so going to get into that at one point. I swear it's going to be a good story. I would get into that. I did want to say that, uh, you know, someone we haven't mentioned yet is Mike Wagoner, who Woo! I love. Yeah. And I love the different, like, it's not font so much, but even just like the different uh, bubble letters and all that, or uh, bu bubbles and such. And just kind of the way, like, there was a lot of tricks and fun that he had in here and also there's a fair like if you look there's actually a fair amount of dialogue but it's very readable like you can right. really go down that page and you know exactly what panel i'm supposed to go to where next and with those many bubble that many bubbles that can be difficult but he really made it happen yeah this is well, why in indie comics it's it's important to have a letter or somebody that knows what they're doing like yeah. if you want to put out a professional book that's where a lot yeah. of fun work Yep. Michael Michael has lettered several things that I've done, so he's used to like having to put six panels worth of dialogue into one panel. So <laughs> he he is really really good at it. Uh, so by now he's he's okay with my BS. He's like, all right, whatever. I'm just gonna put it in there. <laughs> well, and also uh, someone else something else is that Greg is really good about um, creating the space for mm -hmm. Michael yeah. to work in as well. So like it's really weird because very often. You, I, I don't see pencilers thinking ahead necessarily to the letterer, and that's something sadly that that can happen a lot in indie comics. But 
he really like made it happen and that's i mean like it's just it's the team you know what i mean like the team really comes together on this yep yeah and and michael is an amazing guy he really is and i think though his work was made easy on this because you're right the, the there's always placement there's always a place for the dialogue and that's terrific that's that's important um thomas thomas actually i named him after my uh tax guy <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you hoping to get a break? No, it just <laughs> felt like the right name for some reason. And we put out this book like right before, like right around tax time last year. So right. I, had, you know, I think I had just met with the tax guy and I was, or I was having anxiety about having to go to the tax guy. And uh, I was writing that part and I was just like, what am I going to name this guy? And that just popped into my head. Here's a question for you, Eric. Because I don't remember there being any direction in this area. Um, the three panels with uh, Dobbs hanging out in the uh, on the grass and stuff. Uh-huh. Did you have any direction to have him draw that in a completely different and wacky style? Because I love it. It stands out. I think that I think a lot of that actually falls to Avery there. I didn't give him any direction there, but oh. I, think that, I think that a lot of the. I think a lot of the look of that panel comes a bit from the colors because they, they yeah. definitely are different than the panels around them. Yeah. Being it's very cool. Color. Yeah. And I love the, I love the feeling that we were able to give uh, Chamness and Francis of like, you know, the people that have worked together for way too long. Like they definitely like feel like organically, you know, like they're work friends. Yeah. They fall yeah. into that, that work friend thing. Whereas I think if they're not working, I mean, these guys are always at work, but if they had days off, they wouldn't necessarily be friends, I don't think. Right. I don't know if Francis would be friends with anybody, but yeah. <laughs> no, no one would want to be friends with him. <laughs> but I, I do get that, that feeling, like, that they just work together a lot. I mean, we do make the comment that, um, that Francis hasn't left the office in, like, 200 years or something. Yeah, I think it's... 232 cycle or no 212 212 cycles yeah. so, and, and here's something interesting something that eric and i have talked about and i'm not sure when or if it'll happen but um eric actually has a story in his mind about what happened 212 cycles ago yeah to make him I leave. Like the office yep yes <laughs> i i love to do that one well so okay that in that scene so they they dropped this bunny back in time through their um, their machine and they're so this, this team is a team of evolutionary biologists and they um, they basically put creatures back in time and then they see today what they would evolve to and by just observing the world around them and how different it is from when they put them back in time we we say they're evolutionary biologists but really they just do stuff to see what's going to happen. Like not <laughs> yeah. even, I mean, it's not necessarily even science to drop a bunny back in time, but it's right. fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I like the last line where Marcus says, "Looks like an ordinary rabbit," and Francis says, "Yeah, it was." Yeah, I mean, he like right away, he's already like, "Yeah, no, we've already screwed this thing up. Trust me, watch." <laughs> yeah, stuff is going down real quick. <laughs> On the next page, in the first panel, there's like this body suit. Yeah, this like suit. It always reminds me of um, Manny Faces from He Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, yes! <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just kind of hanging out in the background, different angle of the lab. So here's a random question, Eric. Let's say, let's say, just for example, uh, a ghost was running around the Dulce base. You think it could inhabit that suit and walk around? Just uh, ask them for reasons. Write that down. It's written down, no, man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying there are ghosts coming up, but there are ghosts coming up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another thing he asked about Tom is, is that he um, he's a reptilian, which all the Dulce based actual stories center around the reptilians being um, a big force on the, the secret base. Yes. So, He's one of the um, kind of the links to the 
actual stories. So, I know that you, like, this is something that you're really into, obviously, by all the other work that you've done, your other shows, stuff like that. But for uh, for Gene, did you have to research any of this kind of stuff, or did you just jump in and, and have fun with what, what was being offered? Um, you know, a lot of it is, I know Eric did a ton of research into this stuff. He, he really loves this stuff. I looked into it a little bit. But I, I let him be that part of a world builder, and I focus on the, the characters way more. That's something I tend to do, and together it works. Um, I did find for number two, I did a lot more research into different things, because there, there, we kind of take a detour a little bit and go into a different area, which is kind of odd. But um, And so I researched that a little bit more, uh, specifically a character from real history who's, who's going to be in the book eventually. There's some cool ideas involving something called the Spirit Bank. We'll find out about an issue too, and it becomes important to, to at least the plot of this first arc. And we will get a character or two from the Spirit Bank, one that Eric created and one that I kind of came up with, that will be part of the regular cast going forward in season two. And I can't oh, wait because cool. they're they're pretty awesome. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Are. So that's a that's a question I need to bring up when we. When we work on the audio for the next book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, it'll become kind of obvious, sort of. Not exactly who the characters are, because that doesn't that's not even foreshadowed yet. But uh, yeah. well, one of them, one of them kind of is. Yeah, one of them up at the end of uh, issue two. One of my favorite panels um, is on. Well, actually, the next. Okay, so underneath that one with the the android robot suit thing or whatever in the back. That, that picture of Francis is, like, everything. Like, <laughs> look at that picture. <laughs> it's the crossed arms. Yeah, he, like, that attitude. Like, he just, <laughs> well, and both of them, like, have, like, the personalities in, in that panel just are so apparent. I love them. Francis just doesn't want to be there and doesn't really care. He has no patience for your bullshit. That's basically who he is. Right. That's character. He, yeah. he feels like Stanley from The Office. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> and the way the two of them just like just harp on him for being a human, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, at least Chan just tries to have a little sympathy yeah. for him. Yeah, at time. Time. gives it to him. It's great. But Francis uh, just doesn't seem to like him at all. But I don't <laughs> think he likes anyone. No. <laughs> so uh, and I love how so on the next page they're just looking at the monitors. And like it's kind of like not a big deal to them, and Marcus is just like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the battle where the bunny is picking up the dude, and he's just like, "Ah!" It's so amazing. It's so great. And the guy in the right hand corner is just yelling, "Oh yeah. my god!" <laughs> yep. That's so. That panel is like one of my just one of my all time favorites. Like, <laughs> um, but below that, you'll see some of the handiwork of uh, Mr. Wagner. In the uh, the sound effects, oh, yes. yeah, yeah. That's again another person putting their signature on this book. Um, I really yeah. think this book would be totally different if any one of the team were not there going forward. I agree. And then the next page, we meet Gert. Yes. Who? Uh, <laughs> there's a funny thing about him. Uh, the first time we saw a picture of him, uh, I made an observation that kind of changed the character a tiny bit um, because we he was green. And yeah. and that was a bit too much like scrolls to, to, to us, so we yeah. had to change him. Yeah, he looked a lot like the super scroll when we first. Yes, yes. I can imagine that actually. Yeah, and um, and the colors changed it completely. Yeah, I didn't want that. We didn't need a cease and desist on our first issue. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> so he he heads up Team Squatch. Team Squatch yeah. is an idea that I had of these characters that. They go out and hunt down anomalies, like this bunny, like anything that gets left behind, they go out and they hunt down this stuff. So they call themselves Team Squatch because the Sasquatch is the one thing that's eluded them. Um, yes. So I came up with this idea for this team, and I handed it to Gene, and he pretty much created the entire team. I think I named Gert, and I think that was pretty <laughs> much it. I think after that, Gene just ran wild with them. And, they, and when this book becomes a top seller and everyone wants to buy it, Team Squatch is the first spinoff book, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think that'd be a great spinoff book, for sure. I, mean, I love the idea um, here on panel four where he says, per protocol. Like, I love that 
the idea that there's so much crazy crap going on in this place, and they actually have protocols for it. Like, it just... <laughs> It's so much fun, man. It's it's just like it's science fiction and bureaucracy all together, and it's great. <laughs> yeah, and I think I just, as, as silly as the bunny stuff is, like the idea that they aren't like restricted by you know, I mean, they just throw a bunny back in time to see what happens, like right, exactly. <laughs> it's so alien and like that. I mean, it's absurd, but that's like how it would be for somebody going to another planet, and not really caring about what's going on on that planet you know i mean they do care what goes on because they're there too so we right. see that later with the chrono shields and stuff gert gets pissed off at them because when uh they were messing with their machine one of his guys they didn't give the time that they're supposed to give before they launched the experiment and one of his guys got stuck outside of the shields that kind of blocked them from being sucked into that uh the world basically um, yeah, and that's uh, a big part of Gert's character um, he cares very much about the people under his command yeah he was very passionate about that I love so, that uh, we don't have to state that like it's just it's felt it's there I mean that's just good writing I want to be in on issue 3 by the way <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my kissing butt just so that I get into the next issue <laughs> oh you're stuck man you think we're letting yeah, you out of this you're like Marcus man you're stuck here for life yeah. <laughs> Team you have no choice in the matter you better get a bunny <laughs> uh, well Michael Wagoner is your bunny dude oh nice <laughs> he's, a, he's big a big bunny he's a big fluffy bunny <laughs> <laughs> so because one of the characters from Team Squatch was missing Gert demands that they offer somebody to replace that member on the team. And then, <laughs> and then obviously that ends up being the new guy. The bottom three panels are amazing. As as Marcus realizes, yeah, he's the guy. Right. <laughs> and actually, in the, the, the middle panel there, that raised eyebrow from Chim Chumnus oh is my just God. great. It's just like, you know it's you. Like, <laughs> such a... I honestly, I would want to smack him in the face, just like, oh, this guy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things I like that we really haven't talked about much in this first issue, but you find out more about hopefully at some point, is that uh, um, we don't know why Marcus is here. Um, yeah. We find a, a little bit more of a hint in issue two. There's a little conversation between him and another character, but um, the full story is yet to come out. Yeah, and we do have that story, mostly. So the next uh, page is our first um, one panel page. He nails it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, for the most part, when I'm writing, I hate doing splash pages, but this one had to happen. <laughs> it was absolutely necessary to the book. And it looks great. It, it, so much I mean, better than I could have expected. It's the first time you're out of the lab. Like, so, it's like, the, the difference is like a great establishing shot there. It's just, yeah. Absolutely. And it's funny because in the script, we didn't call for them to be covered up for most of that page. So when they when they take off the helmets, you see what they, they actually look like. And that, that was a really neat touch. That was completely Gregory. Right, yeah, you I did. Like They're tracking down their uh, buddy here. There's a lot of back and forth about, like, about what's going on. Um, man, that's a lot of panels on the, <laughs> these couple of pages. Yeah, and our first mention of the spirit bank on on this page. Wait. Yeah, that's right. Oh, there. It, oh, yeah. He talks about it being creepy, and he's like, "You work one floor above the spirit bank, and you think this is creepy? This is nothing." <laughs> yeah, the sub basement. That'll be fun. Dude, I love that you guys did that. Yeah. Oh, this. this you know, the sub basement. I forgot that was something Eric came up with, and it's a really great idea. And when it pays off, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. And well, and. I, the idea I came up with, but you added some touches to that that are going to be fantastic. I can't it's going to be fun. Yeah, come on. We're, we're combined. We're like an evil Dr. Frankenstein. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> they play off of each other really well. Yeah, for sure. Especially with the comedy bits. Because we'll, we'll be talking about something where we're like, hey, this is good, but what if we did this? And we're both laughing on the phone. And it, it only works out good on the page. <laughs> yeah, it helps a lot if, if you are able to, to play comedy off of someone else because just because it's funny in your head does not mean it's going to be funny to a reader. So if you can 
pitch that joke to somebody else and they're able to laugh, you're like instantly, okay, cool, I can use this or, or tool it at least. It's workable. But, you know, exactly. you might throw in a joke, like, you know, if you're doing a book by yourself, you throw in a joke and everyone's like, I don't get it. And like, oh, crap. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. So uh, on these couple pages, they talk about a bit about the, um, the time limit and how um, basically... I don't know. Do we reference the Chrono Shields at all directly? I know they're mentioned. Um, in fact, I think on the bottom page here, uh, if all of this will be reset, what is the urgency in bringing back, bringing Perkins back into the Chrono Shield? So we mentioned it there. There are terrible repercussions for not having someone in the Chrono Shield when time resets itself. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. A- I love these things. I, like, I love this audio commentary because it's something special for Uber fans. Like, they get to, they get a whole other depth. So, something I never asked about and I was always interested is Drexel. He has a different font. What was the purpose of that? Yeah, and um, I think that was Mike's idea. And it was just, he just felt like he should have a different voice, I guess. Like, that's pretty much it. Yeah, it definitely wasn't written into the script that was 100 percent mikey yeah that's so when a letter can possibly affect the story in a whole other way because i don't know about you guys but me seeing that different font it makes me want to figure out why he speaks differently yeah and so yeah like when a letterer is willing to jump and and take that kind of a of a chance and i mean you easily could have just told him, nah, turn it back, like, th- that's silly. But no, instead you're like, you you guys embrace the weirdness, which really is what this book is all about. And yeah, so, that, yeah, like, it's just, it's compiling all on, on top of itself. And I remember yeah. having to think about that one quite a bit. I think we, we had some discussion around it. And um, and ultimately, we were just like, yeah, let's go with it. And that's yeah. Sure. As I've mentioned, I've worked with Michael a ton, enough to know that I trust him when he has an idea uh, and it's never come out wrong so far and with this book this is a book that actually lends itself to experimentation because it, it, it is an off the wall book so something like that really it fits and it really helps and does add to the overall narrative of the story yep so they find their guy and then on the next page the bunny monster finally comes out and they meet him now my idea <laughs> on the bunny yeah. monsters was that so they send back um, that rabbit, and he, over time, you know, over the millions of years, he evolves into a giant rabbit. Because if you think about it, the rabbit evolved from something that existed millions of years ago in some way. Sure. So um, whether it was just a little, like, uh, some molecule or whatever at that time, that's they've evolved to be that little bunny rabbit. So if you take all those years and then throw it back and then let it do it again, like this is what the bunny would evolve to. And right. oh. so my, yeah. my, I think that a lot of times we look at this bunny as if it's that bunny, but this is would actually be a descendant of that bunny. Right, right. right. And so on this page with the with the bunny monster, which I've always called him bunny monster, <laughs> um, that middle panel. With all the sound sound effects from the guns and stuff, that's all some more Mike genius. Yeah, and they have different guns. Um, like Perkins' gun is it's kind of red, and we don't know what it's doing. And the other guys have these like blue kind of guns, more more traditional. So that's kind of neat. And then uh, Avery's colors really help with that too. Like yeah, um, yeah for sure. And the open fire again. That's um, some weird ass lettering, but it looks great. And, and he, it's even in color, uh, which is neat. <laughs> and the bunny is yelling. Um, hey, Eric, r- read us the bunny sound effect. What is he saying exactly? Why don't you do that sound for us? <laughs> Wait, that's not, isn't that just a roar? Yeah, let's, let's hear it. <clears throat> Hang on, I get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't think I was actually going to be able to get you to do that. That was uh, just a little experiment. Thank you. 
<laughs> really, like, I didn't, he, you weren't even going to judge him or anything. You're just like, I just want to know if he would do it. I like exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> you know what? I like on this next play, page the kind of contemplative look of the bunny monster. Yeah. And he, like, it doesn't look savage or anything like that. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of, like, um, the Incredible Hulk in a cave, just kind of, you know, looking out like, Hulk, no smash today, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like eating a can of uh, cold beans or something. <laughs> yeah, right? which, which I love when the Hulk did that. That was my favorite thing about the Hulk in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> he loves cans of cold, cold beans. I love how we refer to the bunny monster as Donnie Darko. <laughs> <laughs> Donnie Darko, and I love that it's Drexel. Like, <laughs> yes, and I like that that uh, Marcus at, at this moment becomes more confident that he's able to solve the problem. Yeah, and you can see it like in Greg's drawing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Even though even though they realize, hey, guess what? I have the tracker. We're kind of screwed. He's like, I got this. On the next page, was that um. Was that writing originally on the uh, wall, or is that all um, either... Um, that was all Greg, right? Is that all... Yeah, Greg? I can tell you it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't me. I think that was Greg. <laughs> yeah. That's so badass. <laughs> it really is. And those the the light around the flares, he nailed that. Like Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah it's really cool. I love the little question mark above the... Uh, Above Dobbs' head. Yeah, that's so like, middle I love that. Like, and and then like that picture, that, that that image in the middle panel, like on the right, like the bunny looks like a crazy monster. Like uh -huh. that is not something I would want to be anywhere near. No, but it's funny because it looks like this page uh, kind of starts the relationship between Marcus and Dobbs. Because Marcus could just like kill the guy, I guess, if he wanted to. But he's not wanting to do that. He's like, hey, little guy. You know, he's trying his best not to hurt Dobbs. Yeah, this is true. And he apologizes when it happens. So uh, I like that. It means Marcus is a good guy, and I like that. Yeah. We have uh, <laughs> we have uh, Marcus running back to the rest of the team, um, kind of pushing things forward. Yeah, he alerts the team where they're at. Holy crap, look at how big Dobbs' mouth is on that one page. Yeah. Oh, he's just yeah, and he, like, pretty much from that one moment on, like, he looks terrifying in this comic for being yeah. a giant bunny. Like, and and here, here's something that I think is, is sort of something I like, and I know a lot of people don't do this. I don't think action scenes necessarily need a lot of dialogue, if any. So you'll see here in the this, in this scene where they're, they're kind of fighting the bunny that there's not much going on dialogue-wise because I don't like that. That feels like a bad 80s movie to me, you know? Right. Yeah. So that page well, was really easy on Mike. He got one one word balloon in that whole page. And I think the dialogue should be able to speak, or the, the sorry, the action should be able to mostly speak for itself. So yeah, yeah, Greg handled that well. Yeah, absolutely. And then we have our our chopper showing up, giving us our our ticking time clock again. Thirty minutes until the reset, which we didn't mention for a couple pages, because we wanted to kind of let that stew for a little bit. But yeah. now, now time is of the essence. And we get our character swearing. Yeah, but it's funny because we kind of drop a couple of minor swear words in the book, so you know that one has to be a big one. <laughs> <laughs> the moment, the moment, kind of, uh, kind of, you know, makes that necessary. Yeah. <laughs> the Dobbs is now called Bugs, as in Bugs Bunny. So another reference there. Yeah, another, and that's again from Drexel, who apparently is all about fictional bunnies. <laughs> he has the best knowledge of fictional, fictional bunnies. <laughs> he has a few books and movies that hanging around. <laughs> um, I, I enjoy the conspiracy stuff, and there's a lot of uh, conspiracies about the vault of knowledge behind Mount Rushmore, and um, so bringing that in as being another sort of base, like repository of knowledge, was a lot of fun. I like that, that a lot. Was, yeah, that was a really cool nod. That was one of the few things. Um, one, one of the things that really stuck in stuck in my head after we did the issue. Uh, you you mentioned the whole repository thing, and I'm like, that's awesome. And and then 
this will certainly come back and play if this book keeps going because that's one of the coolest effing things I could think of. Like the central repository of all knowledge is behind Mount Rushmore. That's so cool. Yep. I think that. <laughs> they all kind of give kudos to Marcus there to uh, essentially save the day. Yeah, despite it being completely outside of his job description. <laughs> and his first day on the job. Yes. And then, it's definitely going to be something. So we, we've talked, um, we've mentioned the work of um, everybody on the book, but Chuck's input on the last page, I think, kind of made the close of this book. I'm just going to smile. <laughs> <laughs> really, I, I, I don't even remember what we exactly had going on anymore, but your notes came back with this idea. And it, it not only did it help close out this book, I think brilliantly, but it also created basically uh, one of my favorite characters in Dobbs. Like, yeah, no, uh, thank you. No, I um, yes, yeah, I think like yes, actually, it basically didn't have the basically the last um, panel. It just like you know, you know, you get the money and, and that was it. And I was like, man, let's let's have some fun with that, you know. And so yeah, that the the end with the question mark and and his big red eye and stuff. Yeah, no, I think that was. Uh, Thank you. I, I was. I'm glad yeah. to have been able to add that, but also that it was pulled off so well. Yes, uh, and again, that's another page with almost you know not a whole lot of dialogue. I guess there's a fair amount of it, but um, I think a lot of it. The art speaks for itself. And how about those pajamas he's got on? I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so like Tom, the, obviously being the nicer between him and uh, Francis, but it's kind of like a. It was. It was a nice gesture for him to you know bring him this bunny that was a, such a big part of like his first day on the job and telling him how he had ex he did excellent work and right and, and let me tell you something about Dobbs uh seeing how Chuck kind of brought him in and made him more of a thing than he was uh, in writing the second issue I kind of didn't do much Dobbs and, I, and that's the one note that I got back from you guys it's like you got to put Dobbs in there more so I went back and I did a rewrite and in doing that I actually fell in love with the character and I realized what it was missing was, yeah, what you guys said, that, that Dobbs needs to be hanging around. He needs to be doing stuff. He needs to be part of the, of the, the tapestry of Dulce Base. And I love it. It's so great. How Greg handles him in issues yeah. is just is brilliant. Like, just, you just want to, you want to go there and, like, rub his belly, you know? <laughs> like Yeah, I want to play, I well, want to yeah. play fetch with Dobbs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he does become very much a favorite at Dulce Base. You you see it at the you know out of issue too. I guess a little time has passed, and he's uh he's in. He's probably in more than than Marcus is at this point. <laughs> it's good because he actually makes more sense than Marcus does. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, they're all kind of freaks out of their element and stuff. And Marcus is a normal human being, and that makes him abnormal. <laughs> this is true. Yes. Yeah, that's true. He's one of the few humans we have on base. Um, you'll meet uh, you'll meet a few more in the second issue, uh, in including one that showed up in the four part uh, four page story. Uh, the cast will, expands a lot in issue four. I will say that um, further down the line, might even be two story arcs from now, but you do find that Marcus maybe isn't as normal as you think, and that maybe he does belong there more than you think. There's a lot of there's a lot of backstory mm. for Marcus. That I can't wait to get to. Yeah, maybe. Even if yeah, maybe that, the events that led to Marcus being there may or may not have been orchestrated, but we can't say. Yeah. At this point, I feel like this interview is going to be redacted by the time we end up <laughs> <laughs> editing it. <laughs> no, I'm cool with it. So, is there anything else about this issue that you guys would like to mention or bring up? Okay, I, I just have one thing that I really like a lot. Uh, the back cover, um, it, it's oh. it's just really, the way it's yeah. put together, it's so awesome. I love this cover. I, this cover could actually be a great ad for the book if put in a, another comic, just like this. You know, yeah, maybe you with know, the web address on there. I always liked how, you know, with a lot of, like, if you grab a paperback book, you flip it over, and you can read what it's about and decide if you want to check it out. And sure, a lot of the times when you get a comic book um, from an indie comic creator, you flip it over and there's an advertisement for the guy who printed it. I I wanted to use that space. Like, 
that's it's valuable space and people pick up these books and they look at the back like they they flip through the whole thing and i'll like so at, at a table i'll often see them pick it up and read the back and then put it back or purchase it if they think it's it's for them and it's a nice way to you know it makes it makes total sense and it's something i haven't done in my books but honestly I'm, i may start doing it because i really i really like it i'm just gonna steal the idea from you because it's it's effective it looks great I think and it's way better than just another house ad, which is what I've done in all my books. Most of them are because I like to stroke myself. It adds for my podcast on the back of the <laughs> books. <laughs> awesome. What did you have, Chuck? I like this little uh, three-panel piece that you did. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. That's you know what, man. Uh, it's funny because I got started like I, I think for a lot a lot of us, you know, we got started in comics at a young age. And one of the things that I got into big time was things like Garfield, Peanuts, um, Calvin and Hobbes, and and all of that was such a, a big part of my youth and stuff. So seeing one of these, and you know, Marvel has done these, and all sorts of people have done these little things. But seeing this in here, it's fun. It's a little three part joke, and you know what? the The funny thing is, is that that could totally be in canon. Like it, yeah. that could have happened. You're right. And that, you know, it just it makes sense. It's not like you went crazy. <laughs> yeah, and um, I think um, I know Eric as well as I are big fans of Fred Hembeck. So when he did, he told me he was doing this little strip thing, I was sold right away. I thought it was a, an excellent idea. Yeah, Fred Hembeck is a hundred percent my inspiration for doing this, and yeah. I want to do it. I want to do it for all of these. And and if your books ever need any, if you guys have any ideas for three panels, I would gladly do more of that. I think it's fun. All right, guys, it's about time to bring this to a close. Thanks for joining me, Chuck and Gene, and hope to see you all at issue number two. It the hole in the ground, or this hole in my heart, or the giant hole in